it was entirely my fault that I got confused about that gospel. And the reason it was is that I am really focusing on the last bit of the gospel this morning, not that first bit. So somehow the first bit sounded foreign to me when I read it. But that last bit, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. That's our invitation this Lent, to take up our cross and follow Jesus. And what is amazing and completely counterintuitive is that through willingly taking up our cross, whatever that might be, we wind up living the fullest life that God has prepared for us. That's what Jesus means when he says that those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for his sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. When we live our lives, not for our own self-gratification and desires, but for the sake of Jesus and doing his work in the world, that is when we find the abundant life that God promises. And that's what we're supposed to be all about as Christians anyway. That's what we do. One of the promises we make in the baptismal covenant is to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself. It's not about gratifying our own desires, but about loving our neighbor. But there's a problem. When we talk about taking up our cross and following Jesus, the first thing we think of is carrying some awful and unpleasant, heavy burden, something that hurts us, something that we don't want to carry. We've seen those images, right, of Jesus carrying that cross through the streets. That's not something that we want. So somehow this translates into the idea that to truly follow Jesus it, that means to make ourselves miserable. We must make ourselves miserable intentionally doing things that we don't want to do or don't like to do. And that that's somehow in our unhappiness, Jesus is pleased. And sometimes this idea of what it is to be a good Christian is so deeply embedded in our psyche so internal that not only do we have the sense that we need to do things that we don't want to do in order to be good Christians, but we also get this idea that somehow, because God seems to want us to be miserable, that's all we deserve. We get the idea that God must not like us very much. Or maybe it's that God is very angry at us just for being born because somehow the idea comes along that we don't deserve to enjoy ourselves and we should just recognize what miserable sinners and awful people we are and that making ourselves unhappy by carrying our cross is somehow our just desserts. It's what we deserve. It's all we can expect in this life. So I know something about this. I grew up in New England. And even though I grew up without any particular church background, the thing is that New England, you will remember, was settled by Puritans. And the air that you breathe is still imbued with that theology. It's just there. You must work hard. No, harder. No, harder. Still harder than that. No, no, no. And you don't deserve anyone's thanks or appreciation. You don't deserve to have anything nice or comfortable or pleasant. If you enjoy something, it's sinful. No matter what. You are unworthy of anything and you had better work your hardest to earn this miserable life that you're living. And if you're not miserable, well, you should be. So stop doing the things you enjoy. 
I'm exaggerating, but only a little. In this context, right? Taking up your cross and following Jesus seems to fit perfectly. Jesus wants you to be just as miserable as he was on the cross because you don't deserve anything better. And we as a culture have encouraged this kind of self-loathing, right? It's not just in New England. So culturally, think about it. All of the advertisements that we see are trying to show us how miserable our life is now, but how great it would be if we would buy a new car, a new pair of shoes, drink this particular brand of soda, whatever it is. And we internalize it. I have a dear friend here in California who grew up, she grew up here and she gave up ballet as a young person which was something she dearly loved, something she was good at because she thought that God wouldn't want her to enjoy her life that much. And how many times, how many times have you seen something chocolate, maybe gooey and dark, a little bit of raspberry, I don't know, bakery or a restaurant with a name that implied that it was sinful? How many of us have received messages that we are less than, unworthy, or irreparably broken, irredeemable? How many of us have been told, either implicitly or explicitly with words, that who we are is not okay, not good, wrong, sinful, worthy of rejection? So, if this is how we're invited to see ourselves, and then we're told that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, how are we supposed to take it? It doesn't make any sense. If everything around me tells me that I am unworthy of love, of enjoyment, of anything other than contempt, well then loving my neighbor as myself would just be dreadful. Okay. What it is is we have to take all these things in the broader context of God's interaction with humanity and with all of creation. Sometimes we have a habit of just looking at the passage right in front of us, especially if it supports some kind of pre-existing idea that we already have. But when we look at the bigger picture and use the lens of God's unending and immeasurable love for all of creation, we see things differently. So to clarify, here's where we start. Start here. God loves you. God loves me. God loves each one of us so entirely, so completely. There is nothing at all that we can do to make God love us anymore. And God loves us, each one of us, so entirely and so completely that there is nothing at all that we can do to make God love us any less. Nothing, no exceptions, none. So with that lens in place, what is it to take up your cross? This is something that someone, God, who loves us deeply is inviting us to do. Maybe it's not a punishment. Maybe it's not about making ourselves miserable. Maybe taking up our cross is the hidden door that will lead us through our attachment to this world and into intimacy with God, into that place where Jesus is present and where our life is aligned with God's kingdom. Maybe taking up our cross will bring us a greater joy than we could know in any other way. It seems like that when Jesus goes on speaking those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life 
We'll save it. That is great. Welcome again to the world that Jesus has turned upside down. When your focus is all on yourself and what you think will make you happy, you won't be as joyful and fulfilled as the person who chooses to follow God, even if it's hard or uncomfortable, inconvenient, unpop unpopular, unprofitable, any of those things that our culture teaches us to avoid. Likewise, same thing, when we look at loving our neighbor as ourself through the lens of God's overwhelming love, if God loves us that much, who are we to hate ourselves? That is often easier said than done. I get it, I know. So I had a therapist once who wrote me what she called a prescription in order to help me in this area. And her prescription was for daily self-indulgence. That's all it said on the piece of paper. That was not easy for me then, and it's not easy now, but loving ourselves is something to strive for, whether it's expressed in self-indulgence or in taking the time to care for ourselves the way we would care for someone we love deeply. And if we love our neighbor as ourselves, while knowing ourselves as deeply beloved of God, then that love of neighbor moves us outside ourselves and again into God's kingdom. That love of neighbor brings us to that place where we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel. That love of neighbor is contained in our baptismal promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, we return God's amazing love to us through finding and loving Christ in each person, in the full knowledge that God loves each and every one of them. That promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself is how we take up our cross and follow Jesus. Because that is exactly what Jesus did. It's how we lose our lives and how we save them. So this week, I invite each of us, I'm inviting myself and each of us to look for Christ in everyone we meet. Easy to say, hard to do, totally. It's not easy and we will, we will forget most of the time, but we can still try. God will still love us and every moment, every moment, is a new chance to take up our cross and follow, to save our lives by losing them, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves.